Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Inca Talk, a new series about the Andes and the story, the prehistory, as they call it, of this Andean world before the Spanish conquest. I'm Peter Frost, and joining me online from California is visual anthropologist and fellow Peru enthusiast, Marin Elwood. Hi, Marin. Hi, Peter. Welcome, everybody, to Inca Talk. Really glad you're here. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. So there are many extraordinary stories and discoveries relating to the Incas, which is one of the reasons why we want to do this series. But one of the most extraordinary I've heard in recent times was revealed by archaeologist Dennis Ogburn of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. In the early 2000s, Dr. Ogburn was doing field work on the archaeology of the Saraguro region in southern Ecuador for his doctoral thesis, when he noticed a number of superbly carved Inca stones in and around the village of Aguixapa. There was no sign and no record of any superb Inca building where they might have come from. Moreover, all the stones were made of andesite, a very hard igneous rock of a blue-gray color which does not exist anywhere in that region of Ecuador. What was going on here? Dr. Ogburn was naturally aware of the tale told in the chronicle of Fray Martín de Murúa, the Spanish priest writing in the early 1600s, about 70 years after the Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire. Fray Murúa stated that the Inca Emperor Huayna Capac had ordered two royal houses built in the Inca capital of Cusco and then dismantled and transported along the Royal Highway to the north, stone by stone, to the Inca province of Quito, which is the modern nation of Ecuador, a distance of more than a thousand miles. Marua's story relates that the stones were well on their way and had reached Saraguro, about 50 miles south of their final destination, when lightning struck one of the main lintel stones. Those are the long ones that span the tops of Inca doorways splitting it in two. Huayna Capac took this as an ill omen and abandoned the entire project after the stones had already been transported, I repeat, more than a thousand miles. Of course, this whole story sounded so fantastic and improbable that no scholar took it seriously. It was regarded as a legend of the Inca times and nothing more. But Dr. Ogburn now had a suspicion, and he had the means to confirm it in the form of X-ray fluorescence, a modern technique which is changing archaeology. It allows scientists to determine the precise chemical composition of certain types of stone, including andesite. Essentially, it turns out that every type of stone has a chemical fingerprint, so that with this technique, you can determine the exact source of a given stone. And Dr. Oakburn determined that those cut stones in Ecuador were from a quarry called Rumicoca, 20 miles south of Cusco in Peru. We're fortunate to have Dennis Oakburn on this Zoom call with us. Dennis, when I first heard the story, I could not get over it. The Incas built structures, dismantled them, and moved entire buildings piece by piece, hundreds of blocks of stone, an enormous distance over some of the world's most rugged and challenging terrain of steep, very high mountains and deep, rugged canyons. How did you come to make this discovery? Well, um, in part, it was by luck. Basically, we were walking across the countryside and recording anything we could see in terms of archaeological materials. Once we started surveying around this small town called Pakishapa, and you know, we're walking all over the countryside, we started seeing a few loose kind of blue-gray andesite stones. You know, these were really nicely shaped, and they were the type of stone that you know, I recognize as being the highest quality of Inca stonework. You know? So it's the sort of thing that should really be in like a temple or a palace, and oddly enough, the historic accounts that deal with Saraguro don't say anything about really important buildings like that. 
Eventually, Dr. Ogbon was to count many hundreds of these stones around Saraguro in Ecuador. What was your rea- what was your reaction when you when you realized that finally I don't know how long it took before you actually knew for sure that these stones really were from more than a thousand miles away. But um, did did that boggle your mind, or did you did you sort of? <laughs> It did. Um, so when I went to Cusco and made it to the Rumi Colca quarry and saw those stones, I saw you know, right away that the, the color, the texture, the mineralogy all kind of matched the samples that I'd collected um, from Akishapa. So you know, by that time, I thought oh, there's you know maybe a seventy-five percent chance. You know, so I was, I was feeling good about it. And then, you know, I had to wait a few weeks after getting back to be able to run the samples. And then, you know, they had to run overnight. And so I didn't know till I got back the next morning that the, you know, the data really came out, you know, nearly perfect. Tell us about the X-ray fluorescence, the tool that enabled you to clinch your identification of the stones. Because this is a technology that is really changing archaeology, in fact, isn't it? So X-ray fluorescence is um, one of the number of techniques we have for doing things like chemical fingerprinting, basically. And so the idea is to measure a set of concentrations of elements within the stones and then match those to the quarries that they may have come from. I noticed in your paper last night you talked about the idea of them moving the stones, in, in particular these, these really high-grade stones, as, an, as a way of mi- almost moving the spirit of that location to another seat of power, and that that was something that, that uh, imbued the new site with the power of the old site. Right. Yeah, part of my thinking about these stones was that they were originally meant for the Inca city of Tomibamba, which Huayna Capac was building up to be the second capital of the Inca Empire. So he spent a lot of time there, he was born there, he named his royal kin group after the site, and in an effort to build that place up and to give it prestige, um, it would have been very symbolically potent to bring these stones from the Rumi Colca quarry of Cusco, because those stones were the ones used for the most important buildings in Cusco, like the Cori Concha, and the palaces, the house of the chosen women. And so it was a symbolic transfer of political power as well as kind of sacred power. And to demonstrate that, 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 that they could actually do this kind of thing uh, must have been also intended to really impress the locals around Kumibamba, you know, who, who'd recently been taken over by the Inca Empire. Yeah, and that's um, another thing that I started thinking about once I did this project. Um, I realized that, you know, in terms of conspicuous consumption, you're often talking about, you know, building palaces and things like that in Cusco. But here you're doing something that's really active, and you're not just impressing the people that would see the final building, because they would, you know, they'd all be told the story that these stones came from Cusco but you're impressing all the people along the way because along that 1600 kilometer trek or however long it was, um, it's going through province after province and this is gonna be a chain of hundreds of stones in a procession and it's gonna be thousands of people that are carrying these stones. And so that would have been a really impressive sight. What was the reaction of local people to you actually wanting, I guess you let you didn't take their stones away from them, but you wanted to go to their houses and churches and so on and check out these stones. What did they think you were up to? You know, they were curious about what we were doing um, as archaeologists. And I, of course, asked them where these stones came from because they were scattered around the, the countryside, some just sitting in fields, some were in people's porches, used as grinding stones outside their houses and inside their houses. There's some all the way back in the town of Saraguro itself. They're, they were used in the construction of the old church at Pakishapa, which has recently kind of been torn down. 
that were used in construction of the new church at Pakishapa, where they formed the base of columns. And that's where we found like the largest stone that I was able to measure, which I estimate weighs up to about 700 kilograms. At one point, I think I estimated there were at least 500 around. And since I've seen the old church in Pakishapa, it's been torn down, you know, that adds another you know, couple hundred. And there's probably a lot more that we haven't seen. So the biggest Cusco stone you found weighed almost three quarters of a ton. When you think that the Inca people had no access to draft animals like horses or oxen, they didn't use the wheel. Dennis, how do you think they were able to move these stones that incredible distance? I believe what they did was create something more like a litter. So they would have two long poles and then have shorter pole straps um, across those and then mount the stones on top of those. And those would allow you to carry those pretty easily. Um, even the largest one, you know, the largest stone, which I estimate weighed about 700 kilos, um, that could have been carried probably about by about 20 people, maybe a few more. Yeah. And I, I always kind of imagine that story from Marua that um, instead of lightning striking the stone, I think somebody just tripped and broke the stone and um, they just made up the story so they wouldn't get in trouble. <laughs> My idea about the, you know, basically building a litter to carry those in, I've found a historic photo from the Cañari area um, in Southern Ecuador that shows some of these Cañari natives doing basically the same thing um, and using it to move a really pe heavy piece of equipment and it was a big work party. You could see in, in the picture, they've put the thing down and they're taking a break. But you know, there's a couple dozen people there. And there's one person using this kind of traditional tuba instruments that the Kanyaris use. So they would have been you know, playing music as they go along to kind of keep in step. Um, so it, it was probably similar to what the Incas did. I imagine you know there could have been music, but they also would have had a bit of a party. Uh, to this day, you know, that's how people work in the Andes. They have, they have a lot of hard work and then a lot of hard partying afterwards. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and in, in some ways, I imagine that the Incas made this out to be uh, an honor for these people to carry the stones. You know, you're carrying these sacred stones from Cusco a thousand miles up to Ecuador. So it was a really prestigious thing. But on the other hand, it could have been a punishment. The Rumi Colca Quarry is about 35 kilometers or so from Cusco. So that's you know, still a, quite a ways to go to, to move those stones. So the quarry of Rumi Colca is really huge. It's a, it was a major operation by the Incas. And there's pits in different places. There's causeways. There's the remains of buildings where kind of the administrators would have been and housing probably for the workers. There were storehouses there. It looked like there were little burial chambers. You know, hundreds if not thousands of people were probably working there. And you know, this one picture of this pit, you can see hundreds of stones, you know, or at least dozens of stones that are worked in kind of different stages. In some parts of the quarry, you can see really nicely shaped stones. Rumi Colca is an amazing place. It's very overgrown, too. Uh, so I'm, and it's an extraordinary place, and yet no tourists ever, ever go there, you know, for me. This is just the, the, extra, the fact that what we know about uh, what's famous, let's say, in Cusco, of the Inca world, is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, that we've do, there's so much more there that really uh, is not known to the public. And uh, I guess that's been my life's work in a certain way is to make right. it more known, you know, to people. Uh, and I hope uh, we could uh, do so, you know, take some visitors to Rumi Coca sometimes and say, look, this is what, there's no aliens involved in all this. This is how they do it. You know, so, yeah. um, just to sort of tease our listeners, I know that you have been 
with Bill Sillar, you have been investigating uh, imported stone at Machu Picchu. And right. um, we don't know where that came from yet. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully that can be a topic for one of these talks up ahead when you've made, uh, when you've progressed in your investigations there. I'd like to really thank you, Dennis Ogburn, for joining us today. Uh, and, and, you know, it's been fascinating to hear this, uh, you know, details of this amazing story that you've, that you've uncovered by your research. And so I hope to join you again in the field someday and looking up here. Yep. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're very welcome. I always like talking about this stuff. Um, you know, I could go on. I've, I've got many more stories to go with this. Um, but to me, this is, you know, the sort of thing that I was just kind of blown away that I was able to, to figure this out and put it all together like a, you know, a puzzle, basically. This is the sort of thing that you know, an archaeologist can go their whole career and not find anything to, that's kind of this amazing. And so this was like the first thing I actually published. So. I was, well, I was quite lucky. Hopefully, so. when we're all able to get back to Peru together, we'll we'll have some more expeditions where we can find some more discoveries. <laughs> oh yeah, there's so much more stuff waiting out there. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. So um, hopefully, we'll all be able to go back next year and 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 meet up and, and see things and and learn more or. Find out some more things we don't understand at all, and then try to figure them out later. So. <laughs>